think six six thirty in the morning. I think so. Uh, but that's usual, I think, on my end. Probably the same for all of you. Teachers have long long hours. Yeah, that's right. But we love what we what, what we are doing. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> my you know uh, recently I had a conversation with uh, some of my students, referring because I stimulate them to have a nice LinkedIn profile, and uh, one of my students uh, said to me, "But your profile is not." is not really nice because you, you you don't give that much information and i said you yes you are absolutely right but i'm not looking for any job because i'm happy with what i'm doing what, what i do on linkedin is sharing whatever i would like to share with my colleagues and my students yes so that is the goal yes so uh, uh but i said of course your linkedin profiles have to be really very well prepared because you will be searching for jobs on the average nine times per uh, professional lifespan yes so that is a lot nine times okay yes is, that's is the that... average mm -hmm. oh, that's, I, I have I, I have to write that down because that sounds like an interesting fact actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nine times in someone's nine lifetime times. yes that's the average how long how often uh an average uh employed person changes job so that is, you know, that's why I always convince them that they should be ready for all kinds of interviews, job interviews, appraisal interviews. Yes, that is oh. uh, an opportunity to sell their unique selling points. Okay, so then there, maybe we can maybe we can get started. Yes, I will absolutely. Say, yes, I will just say a few words about you. If I miss something, feel free to add something. I would like uh, I would like to welcome everybody to this webinar. Uh, this webinar has been uh, organized by IATF in Poland, which is International Association of Teachers of English as a foreign language in Poland, and there is also uh, a section of IATF International. We cooperate with IATF International, and. Uh, um, we offer all kinds of activities to our members, but also to non-members. So if you are interested in uh, learning something more about IATF in Poland, I will provide you in the chat box in a moment uh, with a few useful links concerning membership, our YouTube channel, Facebook uh, webinars, but also Facebook discussion group, Instagram and Twitter, and last but not least, LinkedIn. So you can click through the sites which I will provide you with, and you can find out on your own what IATF in Poland does. Today, we are going to have our uh, next webinar in the webinar series uh, that were started uh, in September. And uh, most of webinars take place on Wednesdays, 8.30 in the morning. And uh, um, uh, I would like to present to you uh, our, our speaker for today, uh, who is Jeff Aristi, Managing Director of Big Apple Business and Master Fears facilitator. Uh, that's how he, that's what he wrote very modestly in the introduction to his webinar. Um, and so before the webinar, I decided to go to your website uh, and I checked uh, what you offer. I, uh, this website is really interesting, the Big Apple business. Uh, and you offer uh, better communication for international success, uh, but also uh, it is subdivided into professional English training, soft skills training, uh, and as you wrote there, reinventing classic English training to achieve more. I like this one. Uh, moreover, leadership, coaching, and training. And uh, uh, you wrote in your uh, bio that for over, over 17 years, you've been providing innovative communication solutions to companies, and you have developed your concepts, which have been tested in the market. And uh, your models and strategies have been adopted by many people, um, uh, successfully adopted by many people. Uh, and fierce conversations, just to add it, uh, is a communication and culture change program 
uh, from best-selling US-based author, Susan Scott. And it is a radically authentic approach to conversation with tools which develop skills for effective decision-making, networking, coaching, feedback, and time management. Um, and as far as your presentation or workshop is concerned, uh, you wrote in your summary that uh, the World Economic Forum recently reported that as jobs are transformed by technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, interpersonal skills will increasingly become important in the workplace and i wholly agree with you and therefore study uh, after study shows that the growing importance of soft skills in education and more than ever uh, in our future professional careers and in your talk you will look at how english teachers can incorporate critical soft skills in the classroom and introduce an exciting new accreditation program. So over to you, Jeff. If there is Thank anything you. that is missing, edit. I, I, I think you just gave my presentation in that snapshot right there, but I will unpack some of the ideas. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you all, everyone for joining me. This is my first Ayatepu Poland talk. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, as Luciana said, uh, reinventing the way we teach business English. That's going to be a theme that I'll come to in just a moment. But um, again, yeah, hello everyone. Welcome to the talk about uh, Fierce in the Classroom or Fierce Conversations, which is a self-skills training concept for English language teachers. This is designed for all of you to take and use. Um, so it is my hope that what I talk about will inspire you, and help you maybe generate some new ideas that you can take and teach in your own training routines. And if these ideas do inspire you, I will mention briefly at the end uh, how you can learn more about this Train the Trainer program, basically incorporating soft skills into ELT. So soft skills training, as Luciana said, uh, ELT, that has been a major part of my work. Um, oh, I think that somebody's having problems. Um, Fatma is having problems with sound that's popping up on my on my uh, chat here. But I'll keep going. Maybe Luciana, you can help us out with that. Um, I so will soft... try to do my best. Yes, I okay. will try. So soft skills training and ELT, that's been a major part of my work for the past five years. And as Luciana said, I've been thinking about how to reinvigorate the language training business for uh, teaching it to professionals. And I think I've been thinking about that for the past 10 years now. So maybe that's a good place to start about who I am. Can you all see the new the, the slide about me? Sometimes I have problems switching the slide. Just give me a, an, a thumbs up. Okay, great. Yes. So um, my name is Jeff. I'm the managing director of a training company called Big Apple Business. A bit of a strange name, but that's only because when I created the name, um, I'm originally from New York City, so that was the inspiration there. That name is actually going to change in 2022, and I think Fierce has played a large part in why I'm rebranding, why I'm changing the way I'm talking or dealing with customers. Um, so that was the inspiration for the name. We were actually located in Munich, and like all of you, I began my career as a language trainer, but I now do leadership training, team building workshops, and I'm a, I'm a certified fierce trainer, and I'll tell you more about that. At Big Apple, the company that I manage, we provide three main services to corporate clients. So we do English language teaching, uh, business English, soft skills development, leadership training, and coaching. So I think we have a, an interesting brand that spans from language to leadership, all in one shop. I'm also an entrepreneur. Um, I run a business. I spend a large part of my time building relationships with clients, growing my network, collaborating with other schools, other trainers. So that's who I am. And that's what I do for a living. I'm not sure if some of those things are a long way from your world. I'm not sure. But perhaps many of you work in secondary education, higher education. I'm sure there are, there are many business English coaches here in the room as well. Um, I deal with professionals of today, but I'm sure many of you actually might be preparing young adults to join the business world of tomorrow. So we have an interface. We are actually in the same field, 
of helping people to communicate and collaborate and grow. So interestingly, I always think about when I'm working with 40 and 50 year olds, why we are talking about communicating effectively so late in your life. I mean, I truly believe that what I do, I can explain to an eight year old. Uh, leadership and communication are not intellectually challenging topics. So I think it's worth thinking, why aren't we introducing these concepts, effective collaboration, soft skills earlier in the education cycle? And I think that could be an ambition of ours. And interestingly, there are places where this is happening, where it's being introduced earlier. Uh, a colleague of mine teaches a master's program at the University of Iceland, University of Reykjavik, um, and he sent me this. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but this is called the Hilal model. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, which is a teaching methodology for kindergarten and elementary school kids where they learn leadership skills, where they are learning feedback skills, uh, where they're learning how to work with teams at the age of four. So again, um, although my background is corporate, many of those things that I teach my clients are also being adapted to young learners so they can foster relationships. Um, with the things I'll be talking to you about today, you will probably may need to modify it somewhat to fit your context, but I think they're all highly relevant for language teachers, wherever you come from, whatever you teach, whatever your context is. So the evolution of EAT, a key question that I've been examining over the years is what is my role in the classroom? Many of the professionals that I work with when I first started in this business almost 18 years ago looked at language training very pragmatically. You know, they weren't so concerned with accuracy. They wanted us to teach them to write an email quickly, how to present their ideas, take parts in meetings and so on, what we classically call business English, which I think many of you are actually involved in. But as those same clients, from my, my point of view, stepped more strongly into international collaboration, they started to see greater diversity. You know, suddenly their international partners are working differently, they are thinking differently, and to the complete confusion and frustration of many of my clients, they are behaving differently. So I've come to the conclusion that the reason why I do what I do is, yes, I want to ensure my clients are speaking English effectively, but more and more, I see my role as helping my clients to collaborate more effectively. And I want to show you what I mean by that, effective collaboration. And this is on this slide here. Uh, the evolution of ELT. This is a warning that I give all my clients before I start to work with them. So don't just learn English, learn to communicate better in English. So I believe if we just teach our clients English, but they are poor communicators in their own language, well, then I've succeeded in making them poor communicators in two languages. So that got me thinking, should I, should we just teach English? Or does our role in the classroom need to evolve? Does our role need to get bigger, bolder? And I think it does, because again, looking at the diversity my clients face every day, professional clients, for example, the diversity of working styles, that's a major one. In the business world of today, there is no consensus on how to manage a project. There is no consensus on how to run a meeting. There's no consensus of even what good leadership is. And I think part of their challenge is dealing with the fragmentation of those functions and navigating that world, at least I think, requires strong soft skills. So for, the, for those of you who are working with business professionals, this is a huge challenge for our clients, but it's also an opportunity for us as trainers to bring those important soft skills into the classroom. But I don't want you to take my word for it. As Tsiana mentioned in the beginning, there is a large body of research that makes the same claim. This has been going on, I think, for over 10, 15 years now, but it's become more imperative nowadays. Soft skills are the new 21st century skill set business professionals must have. And late last year, the World Economic Forum, um, some of you I'm sure might have seen this, put out this rather lar large report making the same claim. Hard skills are not enough. Interpersonal skills will be a focus for the next 10 years as companies prepare their workforce for Industry 4.0 
and the collaboration age. And I believe this has implications for young learners as well. That's why introducing soft skills in the educational cycle earlier is a worthwhile endeavor. Okay, so now what? Hopefully I've made the case that soft skill development is important, that these skills should not only be present in the world of business, but also introduced to young learners. How do we get started here? How do we start integrating soft skills into the classroom? So one of the soft skills training concepts I've been talking about now for the past three years and actively using in language training with my clients is fierce conversations. Okay, so what is fierce and why the word fierce? Because it has many, many meanings. In this context, fierce means being bold, authentic, powerful. So it's, it's a mandate for all of us to start talking about the things that matter in our lives right now, about that project that might be failing, about that colleague whom everyone might be having difficulties with, um, maybe about a personal relationship that's become estranged, distant, that we need to start having conversations in order to course correct that project, to course correct that relationship, to course correct toxic employees that might be interfering with the way a company runs. So how does FIERCE do that? How does FIERCE tackle those kinds of problems? It builds a methodology to create better, stronger relationships, stronger networks, resolve workplace confrontation faster. It helps us to rethink how we have conversations with another human being. And I'm gonna unpack that in just a second. And it gives us six highly structured conversation models, which I will, I will also show you in a minute. And most importantly, it has a compelling philosophy, which comes to us from best-selling author, Susan Scott, who as Luciana mentioned, she will be at the BSIG event starting tomorrow. So if you have an opportunity to catch that, please do. So Susan, let me just introduce her. She's an author, a coach, a business person. She lives in Seattle. She's written several books about communication and her inspiration for all her writing comes from her experience in seeing communication failing in corporate life. She saw very competent business professionals and high level leaders struggling with influencing decisions. She saw a continuous lack of trust. She saw a failure to create healthy feedback channels at these organizations. She saw organizations that resembled more a kind of a battlefield of strangers rather than one team pulling in the same direction. And her book is filled with many interesting and smart quotes. And there are two of them I wanna share with you now. And I'm gonna ask you what you think. So this is from her book, Fierce Conversations. And she says, while no single conversation is guaranteed to change a career, a company, a relationship, or a life, any conversation can. So no single conversation can change a relationship, a marriage, a project, any single conversation can. What do you think she's trying to say here? What does she mean by any conversation can? And you can turn on your mics and come on live or type it in the chat whichever you prefer, any conversation can. Any ideas? There's a basic truth here, there, isn't it? It's maybe it's just very obvious. Uh, Fatima also said, but it sounds, it sound clear. Uh, it sounds clear. I, I hope the message is what you're referring to, Fatima. Uh, what she's saying here is that if you were 100% committed to the other person we're talking to, uh, something wonderful may emerge. 100% committed to the other person, something wonderful may emerge. When I first read that quote six years ago, it transformed the way I talk with people, both professionally and personally. I mean, when you look back on your lives, at those most important moments in your lives, right? That day you met your partner, that job interview, um, we start to discover that our lives very often turn and twist and depend upon unexpectedly important conversations. 
So if we're 100% committed to the person that we are speaking to, something wonderful can emerge. And that quote returns us to core principles, of course, of effective conversation, listening like hell to the other person, asking questions, and remaining committed to the conversation. You all know that, but of course, we all know that this does not happen in real life, especially in corporate life. What we get there is data dumping, people talking at another person, and the mistaken belief, if I say more, then I'm communicating more. So it returns us to the core principles of we need to ask more questions, remaining committed to the other person. Here's another quote I want to show you. She defines where a, what a fierce conversation is. And she writes, a fierce conversation is a conversation in which we come out from behind ourselves into the conversation and make it real. What do you think she means by to come out from behind yourself? It's a slightly clunky sentence, but she's, she's touching upon another uncomfortable truth, isn't she? Iona says, I'd say any conversation can go your way if you actively listen, okay? Referring to the previous quote. Being authentic. Sirka, what do you mean by that? Being authentic. That's a kind of a strange word, authentic, right? We've heard a lot about that. Okay, being honest, saying what we have to say, sure. Sometimes if we're too honest, we might not have the language or the linguistic ability to be able to deliver that message effectively. We might be honest, but we could still leave the relationship a complete wreck as well. So this is not trying to be someone else or something that, yes, yeah. Many conversations happening in companies and elsewhere, um, they are, there's this kind of fear of self-disclosure. There's a deep habit uh, of wanting to hide our weaknesses. And that plays a major role in the way we communicate with each other. So many conversations in companies and elsewhere, maybe even our personal lives are about pretense, yeah? throwing up smoke screens, trying to prove to the other person that I am right, you are wrong, or they're simply waiting for the other person to stop talking so that I can start talking. And Susan actually very cleverly refers to this as versations instead of conversation, right? The con, the Latin word for together with, that's missing. We are talking for our own benefit and not for the benefit of the person who is in front of us. So this quote and the one before is a kind of call to action to kind of abandon and start ad ab abandoning bad behaviors and start to adopt healthy ones. Okay, so those are the two core principles behind the philosophy of fears. Any conversation can, and coming out from behind yourself, as Silke said, being honest um, and making that conversation real. And those positive behaviors that I wanted to, that we want to start to adopt in our conversations with others, Susan says, needs to include four objectives. These need to be in every conversation you have with another person for the rest of your lives. So she says, the first thing you need to do is to interrogate reality. This is the idea that we only own a small fragment of the truth, that reality and the perspectives of others is complex, multiple. So we need to unpack that perspective by, as we all know, asking questions, always being in a mode of inquiry, to stimulate dialogue and not constrict it. If we do that, if we interrogate reality, that provokes learning. We come to the conversation not to talk at the other person, but ask, not to inform, but to stimulate new ideas. And again, in particular, in the world of business, gaining new insights is crucial because that's where creativity is going to come in. That's the space where we can innovate and generate new ideas crucial to the lifeblood of an organization um, or any relationship for that matter. Um, if learning stops, then we won't be in a position to tackle tough challenges. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with project teams over the years who tell me, their language teacher, about a big problem with a project, but they won't report that to the team lead. That kind of procrastination, I believe, has to stop because Burying problems 
costs organization millions. So that has to stop. But if we can get the first three objectives right, that will enrich relationships. Trust can flow, psychological safety will occur. And then we start to have efficient collaboration and efficient relationships with one another. So that those are the four objectives that she says needs to be in every conversation. Those ideas, the any conversation can, coming out from behind yourself, and those four objectives, those ideas, that philosophy are what make up the foundation of a fierce conversation, and they are embedded in these highly structured models. Fierce confront, fierce team, delegate, and coach. So fierce confront, that's a model to help obviously resolve workplace, uh, workplace uh, conflicts faster, improving relationships. Uh, fierce team, um, a model that helps build powerful people networks to solve big problems, developing your own think tank. Uh, fierce delegate, that's a model that helps people delegate smartly to help grow people around you, um, maybe even help people manage their time more effectively, time management being also a critical soft skill. Uh, and fierce, fierce coach, um, borrowing from the, to from the coaching toolkit to help people interrogate the perspectives of others. I'm seeing some comments coming up here, but all these require a great deal of trust in those you are working with. Yep. Or maybe, Iona, maybe it just requires having the rules of engagement clear. And I'll come back to that question. Maybe if I understand how we're going to confront another person and uh, the other person understands how I'm going to confront, they're going to confront me. And if that rule of engagement is clear, maybe something, uh, progress can happen. But I'll come back to that question. I think all of these models can also be adapted to fit any teaching context as well. Let me just say that. This is also important. What I like is that all of these models are highly structured. They are simple visuals to complain, uh, to convey complex ideas. They're very easy for non-native speakers to engage in. We've used this material with B1 level students and up. And I think these are tools that I think that your students, clients can also use for the rest of their professional and personal lives. And because you're teaching it to them in English, they're receiving a dual benefit, English learning plus soft skills. Okay, so this would not be a proper talk if I didn't involve all of you in the conversation. Maybe Iona, I could answer your question there as well in this activity. So I want to show you how FIERCE works. And I'm going to do that by showing you one of the models, Fierce Confront. And this, the way I'm going to show it to you is exactly how I present the model to my clients. So I start by asking them, what do you see here? And that is a question I would like to put to all of you. What do you see? What does this picture represent to you? I'll look at the chat or come on mic. And tell me, what do you see? It's a bit strange. Curiosity, okay, good. A face, a torch, and a magnifying glass, someone looking for solutions, okay, very good. All right, you're seeing right past it. When I first show this to students, they start to see something what might appear scary, uh, a skull and crossbones, when you start to look at the image. So with this simple image, we can start to unpack many of the fears that we have when we need to deliver an uncomfortable message to someone. You know, confronting is a very scary exercise, but if you look closer, as many of you already pointed out, you start to see the tools of investigation. There's a magnifying glass, a flashlight or torch, and the image is meant to bring home the point that, I guess every confrontation is the search for truth. We're not trying to attack the person, we want to solve a problem. Fatima says, passionate or romantically, what do you mean by that, uh, Fatima? If I could have you come online to explain that. No? Okay. 
So this is the first image that I show my students and they take a look at that and sometimes they see, see things that are scary, but again, looking more closely at it, the tools of investigation. Okay, so confrontation, exercise, a search for truth, that sounds sensible, that's something I think most people would agree with, but again, does that actually happen in the real, in the real world? And I wanna test that with all of you. I'm going to put you into a breakout rooms for three minutes. And this is a fun exercise. I'd like you to consider two questions, which are up on the slide now. Number one, the first question, what are some strategies we use to change someone's behavior other than having a clear and direct conversation? Two ideas. And the second question, how do you justify not having a clear and direct conversation? Give me another two ideas there. You can't take my slide into your breakout room, so I just would suggest taking a photo with it with your mobile phone or maybe doing a screen grab. Grab those questions and uh, we'll send you off into breakout rooms. Luciana, I don't know if you can help me with that, but I guess I can also. Yes, just click, click on uh, more, yes. Uh, where you have the three dots at the toolbar at the bottom, and mm, then right. uh, you have uh, breakout rooms there, yes? Okay. Or maybe I should put everybody in the breakout rooms. That would be great, because actually I don't see the three buttons because I think my oh. PowerPoint is All right, up. so I will do it, <laughs> but that means that you will also be in one of them, so then you will have to exclude yourself. Uh, I Perfect. will assign uh, automatically. There are 19 uh, participants, so uh one six breakout rooms yes correct yes. or five uh five maybe five that sounds that sounds right and i would say three minutes is about mm -hmm. enough time for us to oh, i'm opening people. all the rooms and as soon um as uh, you want me to we will we will close them yes okay. so i will be in one of them probably as well four people in room one four people in room two that's uneven in room three, we have just two people. <laughs> okay. Hello, hello. You have to unmute yourselves. Yes, you will have to unmute yourselves just to be able to talk in the breakout rooms. Wait a minute. Maybe I have this option. Um, I start video so that you can see me as well. If you need to talk to me, right? Uh, maybe I will visit each of the rooms. So room one. Join. Yes.
I've been redirected to the main session. I don't know, I, I, I've lost my partner, but it's okay. We've come up with some of the ideas, so I think it should be enough. Can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. I can't hear okay, you. Okay, I've unmuted myself. You should be back to the main session, but in I let's see. say 40 seconds, okay. I close the rooms and right. it takes one minute to close the sessions. So I wonder why you, you were uh, relocated immediately. Yes, immediately after I closed the room. So that's okay. <laughs> Welcome to the main session anyway. <laughs> uh, and probably you will be able to, uh, to discuss some of the ideas that you discussed in the breakout rooms. I see that Marta Klepuszewska Siran is with us, but Marta is muted. Marta, if you want to say something, and Sika uh, is also muted, so unmute yourselves. Oh, yes, Marta I've, has a, yes. I've already I unmuted myself. I told you that I've been back to the main session earlier than I expected. <laughs> ah, I see, I see. So that's, that, that, that was you. I, yeah. I thought it was another person telling me about it. Okay, I see that uh, there is some, someone has been relocated to the waiting room. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> we are all in the process, yes? Hopefully managing with everything. Jeff, you need to Jeff, unmute yourself. You're on mute. I'm back, okay. All right, so let's look at the first one. Um, what are some strategies we use to change someone's behavior other than other than having a clear and direct conversation? Go ahead and shout them out. What are some ways? Silka, you are right in my line of sight. So I'm going to... Sure. Um, I, I'd be happy um, to share what we discussed in our group. I have to admit, the three minutes were not enough. Um, we, we really only one person get to speak about one possibility for answer number one. And Rosie, this was your idea. So I wonder if you would like to share it. I really, really liked it, but I, it's your idea. So Rosie, would you like to tell the group what you do? Rosie, if you are muted, you have to unmute yourself. That happens, you know, whether you do something or not, that happens sometimes automatically. So check if you are not muted. I did. I am. I am uh, unmuted. Oh, oh very well. So oh, there go you ahead. Are. <laughs> here? What are okay. some strategies we use? Okay. Um, when I have a uh, bad timber students or uh, nervous they're naughty they're troublemakers uh, i use the strategy of telling a story um, huh. i get them to tell me what happens next uh, what do you think will happen uh, what is the moral of this uh, of this story what do we learn from the story they tell me what they have understood and then i hmm. relate to what happens before to the their uh, to the moral lesson they got, and I listen from the from them. They just say we shouldn't have done so and so. We are sorry to do this. And by the way, they follow this rule next on from on. Yani, uh, this uh, this they don't change uh, because in this in this situation only. No, I find that this changes their character sometimes. I mean, I think that's the very point of stories, right? Good narrative to teach a lesson. How how old are the kids that you work with, Rosie? Um, maybe not more than six years old. But with all the mm. students, we discuss situations. Yeah. With younger students and not more than six years old. I um, sometimes I find the story in front of me. Maybe uh, my mind. Uh, makes up a story, uh, a lot of things like this. Hmm. Um, sometimes the situation is not prepared, uh, just comes spontaneously. Hmm. I like the idea of storytelling, um, but as you pointed out, with adults, that becomes a bit more complex. 
I, I know that some of the ideas that um, that have been mentioned to me before is what what we do when we don't have a clear and direct conversation with someone. Um, people will say, well, I don't have the time. Uh, it's, it's not going to change anything. Yosef, a uh, person I was in uh, the breakout room with, says, well, you tend to beat about the bush, right? You never really say what you really want to say. And then, of course, Yosef, when you walk away from that conversation, you think to yourself, well, what, what the hell just happened there? I wasn't able to deliver the message I had to deliver. It gets postponed. So those are all typical strategies that we as adults, we love to procrastinate, especially for these difficult messages. What about the second one? How do you justify not having a clear and direct conversation? Any other ideas? One of them was, of course, it's not going to change anything. How do we justify not having a clear? Think of your personal relationships. That's a good place to start. I'm tired. Maybe there's... Um... Maybe there is this 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 relationship, this power play, and if you have to have a uh, an honest or like a clear conversation, say for instance with a supervisor, um, mm. you might feel uncomfortable doing so, um, and most likely you will because ultimately it's it it it's down to them whether this is going to go well or not, <laughs> no matter how much you try, right? So I, I would say probably that might be a reason to justify not going that way. Um, so authority. Yeah, my, I, I, I can't tell my boss what to do. Exactly. So I, I own a, if, if you're actually working with an organization that where you see that happening, maybe a powerful question to ask them would be, um, are we liberating communication? Are we free to say the things that we need to say that are deeply problematic? within an organization? That is a um, very, very good question. And it definitely mm. has value. Um, and I was going to ask you, this is, a, I'm going just a bit on a tangent. You don't have to answer this now, but mm. um, I was wondering, and I'm pretty sure that there is, there's some truth to this. While the question is great and it's, it works really well on paper and in theory, uh, would you think that it's, strongly dependent on the cultural environment in which is is um, presented. And when I mean culture, I don't mean just corporate culture. I mean, culture as in traditions. I mean, culture in the sense, the real sense of the word. Hmm. Because, yeah. um, so I'm, I'm working in the Czech Republic and hmm. uh, I've noticed this across different, I've, different schools that I've worked with, different institutions, different businesses uh, that this um, lack of honest conversation, apart from the fear of authority, um, it also, uh, how to put this, like they, they do mitigate for, um, or they advocate for um, having open conversations, except that these open conversations, uh, there's an untold rule that they can only tackle aspects that are not truly problematic. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's there's a great line in Susan's book. Uh, the conversations that we are not having, those are the conversations that are going to cost you the most in the end. So, I mean, you could think about even looking at the news cycle uh, these days. I mean, how many conversations do we have to have or should we have had in the past in order to prevent catastrophe from happening? Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Scotland and the COP summit that was going on. Right. A lot of conversations. Um, Rosie, you have your hand up as well. Um, yes. Um, not having a direct or a clear conversation. Uh, you remind me with myself when my mother told me, don't put your hand near the arm machine because you are going to burn yourself. And I wasn't convinced about this. I tried to see what, how does it iron the clothes. And mm -hmm. I still have the mark on my hand. Okay. For us, for the students, for children, okay. Uh, most of these minds now can do, uh, are not easily convinced to do things 
uh, just by uh, yes. uh, directions or conversation or telling them instructions. No, no, not at all, not nowadays. Especially the younger generation or what we can call the generation alpha. Hmm. Uh, they are from 11 years old. Uh, um, yes, they are 11 and down, okay? Uh, these children are uh, technology uh, people more than us. Uh, they cannot do anything uh, just because you want them to do. You have to convince, you have to negotiate. Um, maybe you spend a lot of time to tell them that this is not true, this is not right, this is not correct, you have to do so and so and so. Uh, most of them try to experience the thing, then they are convinced to do things. That's how we are, we need to have indirect instructions using experience, using story, using a movie, using a song, so and so like this. Maybe the problem is in the telling, maybe those insights need to be self-generated, which is a, a, a coaching practice, of course. With them. Maybe because of the uh, pattern of our lives, we don't, have a, we don't have channels to communicate with them. Okay, uh, that could be, yeah, for, for, for much younger people. Um, you mentioned something earlier when you were looking at the questions here. I'm gonna show you all four of these questions and Silke, you are right. I did not give you enough time to unpack these questions. But if you start to look at all four, these are the four, four questions. Um, and if you look at them closely, I'm sure you can see these are powerful coaching questions. You know, why are we doing this? Why are we bothering to ask these questions? Some of these answers might seem very obvious, um, but why? Why do we do that? Why do you think I would want to spend an hour, an hour and a half asking people these questions? These powerful coaching questions. Because as we know, coming from the coaching tradition, when we start to ask, we start to surface assumptions um, and maybe negative assumptions around confrontation. And all those hidden That's why assumptions. The skull and I, I just wanted to add that, you know, all those hidden assumptions make our communication really very, very difficult. Yes, because what we what we say doesn't show what we really think. Yes, so there is this breakage in the communication process between the message that is on our mind and the message that our interlocutor receives in communication process. I think exactly. it, also um, may, it also may feed into our biases. So instead of, you know, say you don't want to have a conversation with a particular person for whatever reason, uh, there's apart from the justification that you create for yourself, that also plays into the biases that you already have. And I think it just, you know, ultimately you just keep on pushing the same problems, you know? Yep, biases, negative assumptions around confront, our own fears, the coaching questions are meant to surface that and to have a discussion around that. And as Silke pointed out, you need time to unpack this. But this is such a wonderful, rich activity for people to easily engage in, especially for adults, even young adults, for them to engage in. What is our fear around confrontation? We surface them, and then we start to adopt healthier habits. And those healthier habits would be going back to the, the core philosophy of fears, any conversation can, coming out from behind yourself, and those four objectives, enriching the relationship. Sitka mentioned being honest is a very important part, but um, sometimes honesty can go in lots of different directions and go, can go terribly wrong. Um, are you leaving the relationship better than when you first entered into it? So let me show you this. This is kind of the last part of the, um, oh, okay, let me show you this because this is interesting. Uh, common errors, common errors. Somebody mentioned this to me as well. Um, so we've we, we surfaced those, in, those, those poor behaviors. Um, we're going to try and adopt healthier ones. Now let's identify some of the common errors that most people make 
when they confront someone. So tell me what's wrong with this. I go into a conversation and I go to Rosie and I say, Rosie, um, I want to say something to her, difficult conversation, but I say, so Rosie, how's it going? What, what's wrong with that? Um, I don't know, maybe, um, I don't know, how's it going? Maybe you are not friends with me. You're not, you're not friends with me to tell me how's it going. Oh yeah, it, it's a little inauthentic, right? To start off the conversation with, yes. so how's it going, right? What about this one here? You're great, but you're bad, but you're great. <laughs> What's wrong with that? I can, I don't know, sit down or stand up. It's confusing. Yes. Right? <laughs> if you want to compliment somebody's performance, um, then maybe that... you are confused to tell me you want you have something to tell me, but you can't find the link to tell me this. This hmm. means that you you yourself is confused too, not me. Yep, that would confuse me uh, certainly. If I want somebody to compliment me on my performance, that's a separate conversation. Yeah. So don't contaminate the um, any any praise that you want to give to someone with a confrontation exercise. What about this one? I get this sometimes at home. You did this, you did that, you did this, you did that. Are you just this watching? Is... Are you just watching me? Why are you telling me you did this, you did this, you did that, you did this? No, no, get me out of your head. That's what I'm going to tell you. Okay, it's going to trigger a lot of defense mechanisms, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and all you're doing is you're just, you're just data dumping on somebody. All the problems that you've kind of secretly bottled up inside because you didn't deliver the confrontation uh, earlier when it was relevant. What about this one? I'm sure you didn't mean it. This is very popular in America, actually. Now, I'm sure you didn't mean it. I'm sure this wasn't your intention. What's wrong with that? I think you are, no, uh, please, maybe I meant to do so. You haven't entered my mind to, to, to do so and so. But if I allow you, if you are friends with me or, or you are close to me, uh, I will take it from you as an uh, indirect advice. It's indirect, exactly. You're softening the message, which is only going to lead to more confusion. So these are the, these are the, the common errors that we see and that I see every day last, in corporate life. The last, one, the last one, I sometimes accept it. The last one. Okay. Uh, sometimes I accept it. In, uh, uh, when I get a conversation, when I get a direct, uh, some instructions or uh, some discussion about a specific situation, Sometimes I get the last one, I accept it. It doesn't okay. matter. All right, that, that's not a lot of people have the professional maturity to mm -hmm. accept that actually. And again, yes. there are very competent business professionals that do this all the time. I'm sure that you are working with clients that are doing this as well. I'm sure of it. Uh, no, I don't do this with my... With my uh... <laughs> With my mates, colleagues. no doubt, but I'm sure that it's happening. It's happening in corporate it's structures. It happens to me. Sometimes I'm sorry. It happens, to oh, so it happens to you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But and so. I get defensive situation. This is the defensive attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, when you tell me you did this, you did that, you did this, you did this, uh, you kill the contact between me and you. You can never, after that, you can never uh, communicate with me anymore. Okay, all right. I mean, that's the, okay, yeah. I mean, it, it, falling into these common errors could cost a relationship as yes. well, couldn't it? Yes. So let me show you the exercise that Fierce advocates for. This is the final step here. So what I'm gonna show you, I know we're running out of time, Seven steps to use when you need to confront another person. Seven steps, this is all part of the model. So what you do is using these prompts, which I'm going to show you in a minute, is to script or write down the actual conversation you are going to have with another person. So if I need to tell Luciana, I'm 
you know, there's something I, I have to get off my chest. I have to confront her. I'm going to not confront her just yet. I'm going to write it down using conversational prompts. Now, just to, let me ask all of you just really quickly, why would I want to do that? Why should I write down word for word what I want to say to Luciana? Because on a second read, or actually on the on a first read after you wrote it, um, it allows you to, first of all, reorganize your thoughts and have a yes. better um, you know, outlook on things. And I think it also allows you to look at it with, even if you're in, in that zone where you're like angry or whatever it is that you're going through, but mm. once you read it and you see what you are capable of saying, you may want mm. to reconsider and rephrase. Yeah, it diffuses maybe your frustration. It disarms your frustration in some way. Right. So if you, if, you, you, if you write it down, you can start to think about what you're going to say. And the benefits of scripting this are obvious. I'm sure we all know this, but people don't take the time to do this. It allows you to avoid the common errors that we discussed. It allows you to bring in the four objectives of both learning and the rich relationships. And um, for us as trainers, language trainers, we can look at certain words and language that may not be constructive, that may not be appropriate. So this scripting exercise can be also be a rich linguistic exercise, drafting, redrafting. So let me show you the seven steps and I'll do it with you really quickly. Um, so the first one, I'm gonna give you an example. Um, so Silka, I'm gonna use you as an example. Um, Silka, I want to talk to you about being late to our staff meetings. Okay. You know, last week and just today, you came to our Friday meeting 15 minutes late. You coming into the meetings left me and others feeling frustrated. I mean, we can't start this meeting without you. This is a busy time for all of us. And when you arrive late to these meetings, it delays our work and it becomes difficult to, to meet important project deadlines. This is the important one here, number five. Maybe, Silke, I'm part of the problem. Maybe I should have been clear about how important this meeting is and how it's important it is to start on time. I really want to fix this, Silke. What do you think? So Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> when you write down this script mm -hmm. and you're to deliver it in three minutes, three to five minutes, but that is the beginning of a confrontation dialogue. Positive, constructive, interrogating reality. You're entering into a collaborative discussion for both parties. And I think it was Iona, I, Ioana, um, imagine now if everyone within a company uses this structure, right? If we all understood the company culture, I know it gets a little bit more messy when we start talking about national culture, mm -hmm. but just imagine if companies were to adopt this structure and if they did, they would have a feedback culture where poor behaviors and confrontation are regulated, adopting positive behaviors, that becomes a norm. And that is what Fierce is trying to achieve, a creative culture of openness and of learning. What do you think? Am I crazy? Oh, I love this. Imagine that, adopting a culture of confrontation where everybody is clear what the rules of engagement are. I know it, you know it. And the most important thing any organization, I think that need, what they need is this feedback. It's actually not confrontation, it's feedback, isn't it? I like, I'm having problems with my workmate uh, and I was thinking about how to discuss this problem. I, I, I think, is that you, Luciana? I think you have to type it into the chat because I think your mic is coming in and out. No, no, I was, I was away from the mic, from, from the phone. Oh, Rosie, sorry, yes. I was talking to myself. And oh, okay. <laughs> uh, this um, I have problems with my workmate. With one of my workmates, I have problems, but I know I don't know why she is uh, dealing with or treating me like this. 
and I was thinking about this. And sometimes I, this uh, strategy um, works with me because a lot of most of the time I like to type or write uh, what I think of uh, because I forget uh, the ideas. I just remember the last idea I am thinking about, and the previous ideas I don't remember them. So mm -hmm. I try to uh, write down what I uh, what uh, what's prob what's the wrong or uh, the situation that happened uh, to discuss it with uh, with her. But I don't think I'm going to discuss it with her because I don't think she is going to uh, react as the uh, wanted way. As okay, Rosie. It, it sounds like you're postponing the conversation. And what this is exactly what Fierce advocates for is don't hold it, have the conversation. So it sounds like, Rosie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this the entire model available to you. I invite you to take a look at it. It'd just be wonderful to see that you writing it down, that script. Sometimes when I give this to clients, the original problem that they had thought it was uh, after they script it, it turns out to be something else. Um, that could also happen in this redrafting phrase, phase. All right. Um, I think this is a lovely idea. What if some people are not ready to be confronted? Uh, can't take anything that might challenge them? Well, I think if you use this model, stripping it from all of the trigger words, keeping the conversation positive, and what I mean by positive is including the four objectives, maybe that might be um, the key to it. It might not happen in that first step, but at least you start to cut away the noise of emotions that sometimes prevent people from having constructive conversations. I wonder if number five can be a problem for our clients. Uh, yes, there are a lot of egos involved. But if you look at the literature of, let's say, shared leadership within organizations, um, it's fairly complex. I, if I empower an employee to do something and that employee makes a mistake, I have to bear some responsibility for that. This is a core component of the literature we're starting to see coming out in, in leadership, at least. So it's shared uh, responsibility. I am to blame. And I guess if if your goal is to just pin the blame on someone else, how far is that going to get you um, in the long run? All right, so um, my last slide for you tonight, thank you for hanging out for this, this, this long, but I just wanted to let you know that if you're interested in Fierce Trainer and what fears can do, you have the Confront model, I invite you to take it, play with, your, play with it with your students. Uh, there is a Train the Trainer program called Fierce Trainer, which is designed for language trainers, all of you, uh, and coaches um, uh, that can certify in this concept. And you're standing behind a brand, reputable brand like Fierce. And if you want to learn even more about it, uh, we're gonna be at BSIG. And tomorrow, I hope you all have tickets, Susan Scott, um, the author of Fierce Conversations will be speaking at BSIG, five o'clock tomorrow, UTC, I invite you to, to, to listen to her. She's a, I think she's a wonderful, compassionate human being. And I think she has a lot of insights. Um, in the sessions, we also have um, Mark Powell and Amanda Jane Franklin. These are two people that went through the certification process. So if you join their talk, you can hear it from them, how it's impacted them, uh, their training routines. Um, and that is on Sunday. And of course, I will be around, floating around. I think there are two drop-in sessions. You can look it up in the program. So you can always talk to me there as well. So um, that's it. So I thank you all very much for, for being a part of this, this talk. I hope you found this useful. Thank you very much, Jeff. I think we all enjoyed it. There was very lively discussion and everybody yes. uh, uh, managed to say something. Uh, and we hope to see you uh, on Friday. Yes, you said tomorrow that is Friday. Yes, tomorrow is Thursday, but we, we discovered it. So we all we all know about it very well. Okay. Friday, yes, not tomorrow. Yes, sorry. I'm rushing the week. 
<laughs> yeah. Thanks, everyone. Is there anything that anybody would still like to, to, to ask at the end of the session? Do we have any questions, any comments, anything that you would like to express by just saying it to us rather than writing? I'm checking the chat box and in the chat box there are thanks for you and appreciation and respect and thanks a lot and saying that it's been very useful and very interesting. So you have received your positive feedback, yes? That makes me very happy, yes. <laughs> Trainers also need that positive feedback, don't they? Feedback thank is. you. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. And You're welcome. Uh, I will be looking forward to the next webinar, yes? So that we will be able to develop our skills further because you have really Absolutely. inspired us with, with ideas that were uh, uh, so interesting, but they need reflection. Yes, they need reflection. I've made a few screenshots and I will reflect, I promise to reflect on, on the content myself. So thank you very much, everybody. Oh, I see that somebody wants to be readmitted. Maybe they want to say something. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And goodbye, everybody. See you at future webinars by uh, Ayat Paulette. Thank you, Lisanna. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.